So I'm 55 years old, and that's a really interesting time because our parents are at this place where we start worrying about what's going to happen with them. But remember, I talked about half of my life ago when I was 28, I ran a retirement home. So I'm really familiar with this. Even so, I'm watching it happen to my own families and it's different. So when it's other people's families, it's a whole lot easier for us. And what the point is, is that they typically don't prepare for crisis. I watched it so many times and they're worried about having to move into this horrible place where they don't want to go, but they don't do any planning. And the most unfortunate thing of all is they end up there because they didn't plan where they wanted to go. Now the smart ones, they came and they searched all the different facilities and they found out how to plan and what choices to make to create a future that they wanted to have. Well, there was an interesting lesson for me because I'm seeing the same thing in the bipolar world. I know a lot of people who have already scoped out what they're going to do, where they're going to go, who's going to be there to help them. And whenever they go into a crisis, it works for them. Well, unfortunately, the people I do know around there, some of them, they plan for crisis. They don't plan for a better life. They just accept a life that has these constant recurring crises. So we've kind of got to do both. We should have a crisis plan, but it shouldn't be our plan. That's not a wellness plan. That's a backup plan. So there are a lot of people who go, I created a plan, which essentially is I've planned to have another crisis. Well, you should have a backup plan that says if another crisis happens, I've already thought through what to do about it, but then you should plan for a better life. So your crisis plan shouldn't be your quality of life plan. They're two different things, but we're going to focus now on crisis plan. And what you want in a crisis plan is a handful of things fairly well thought out. The first one is, how are you going to identify that you're in a crisis? There are obvious signs that other people see that we don't. A lot of doctors say that we're not capable of seeing it. They're saying that bipolar disorder is an inability to even recognize it. There's even books written about the fact that we can't recognize our disorder. And that may be true for a schizophrenic who's totally oblivious to the fact. But for most bipolar people, they just haven't been taught how to recognize it. So the first thing we want to do is come up with a list of here are all of the things that I can recognize physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually in my social life and in my career and finances that will indicate to me and to the people around me that I'm out of control. That's not that difficult of a task if we sit down now when we're rational and think it through. We can look back at past episodes that were crisis. We can look at other people's crisis. We can discuss it with other bipolar people, with friends and families and doctors and therapists and come up with a realistic plan. Matter of fact, we have a database where we can all put it in and we can start recognizing all of the signs. Now the signs are typically when I get to this level of intensity, which is the wrong way to look at it. It's not the level of intensity that's the problem. It's our thoughts and our behaviors. It's the way we react to the level of intensity that's the problem. So we want to focus on how am I thinking? What thoughts am I having that are indicating that a crisis is either coming on or is there? And how am I behaving? It has nothing really to do with how intense it is other than the fact that at higher intensities we have those tendencies. So our first step is recognizing all of the different areas, our thoughts and our behaviors that are indicating that we're going into a crisis. We should learn to recognize those, but we should also entrust those around us to help us to recognize those. Recognizing those people around us as our team is a critical piece of that. Now, we talked earlier about creating a team, and that team are all of the people that are going to help us. And if you look at that team, there may be a fitness instructor in there, there may be a nutritionist, there may be a masseuse, 
there can be all kinds of members of that team that are there to help us make it to bipolar in order. Well, during a crisis, they're not necessarily our members of our team that we trust and feel good about during a crisis. So if you look at your team, you're gonna see that there are this combination of members on my crisis team and members that aren't on my crisis team. So let's focus on my crisis team. I need to have a doctor and a therapist or, or at least one of them on my team because they're the professionals that are gonna help me in the crisis situation. My family members may or may not be on my team. You know, somebody might have a mother that they can really count on when things are going well and they're moving towards bipolar in order, but that totally flips out when a crisis happens and, and makes it worse. A spouse can play the same role, so we need to either educate them and help them to become productive members of our crisis team or decide that they shouldn't be on the crisis team. We might have some trusted friends that we put on that team. So as we think through the team, we want to pick people that we're going to feel good about and trust during the crisis. Now the next step to that is to figure out what you're going to do in the crisis. We figured out how to recognize it. We figured out who's on our team. Now we want to look at what are we going to do? Well, not every crisis ends up in hospitalization but we should at least accept the fact that it might and go around the area and look at all of the facilities. Remember, this is what I tried to get the retired people to do before that choice was taken away from them. Go take a tour of all of the facilities in the area and see what's good and what's bad about it. Well, there's a really good sign of the ones you never want to end up in. They won't even let you in the door. If you think about that, it's kind of interesting. You can go to San Quentin prison and you can go in and see the most hardened criminals in the world. You can go in and take a tour of a prison, but you can't take a tour of a mental health facility, especially like a county mental health or inside of a hospital. Why? It's kind of an interesting idea. But most of the better facilities are going to let you come and take a tour of the facility as a prospective customer and see if that's kind of a place that you would be comfortable in. Now you also might do another alternative to say, I would like to go to this retreat center as long as I'm not out of control. I would like to create a facility that works for me. Now I can either go to a hotel and turn that into the kind of facility I want. I can go to a hot springs. I can go to a spiritual retreat. The problem is, is I might be going to a place that's not aware of how to recognize if I escalate. So I want to kind of think through what the facility should be like where I might need to go. Once again, I may not need to go, but I'd rather have made that choice than have that choice made for me. Because when the choice is made for me, it's typically not the choice I wanted. It's typically the choice that I least want. So we should build ourselves a list of here are the top choices and then here are the choices I don't want. So we should build a list that says here are the top choices and here are the choices I definitely don't want. Speaking of which, when I build my team, I should recognize people and put them on a list that says keep those people away from me. These are people who are probably going to trigger me and make things worse for me. So we've looked at how do I recognize it? Who do I get on my team and what facilities are available for me? And now we want to look at what am I going to do to intervene? So when we're in a crisis, the primary goal should be getting rid of it as soon as possible. I want to use the most powerful tools I can. Well, if you look at medicine, there are good medicines and bad medicines, especially if we've got some history with them. We want to take a list of here are all the medicines I'm currently using how much I'm using of it, what the dosage is, etc. So we at least can tell our doctor if we end up in an emergency out of state, here's what I'm currently on. We should also look at here's all the medicines that I definitely do not want to take. They've had bad side effects, they've had bad reactions with me, or I'm just opposed to that particular medicine. We should build a list like that. So that's part of our intervention, but it certainly shouldn't be all of our intervention. We should then look at all the other types of intervention that are going to happen, especially if we don't end up hospitalized. 
we might build ourselves a list that says I'm going to get a daily massage. I'm going to have these friends come over and visit with me. I'm going to watch these movies. These are the kinds of things I'm going to do to intervene and try to lower the condition for myself. It could include walks and proper sleep patterns and nutrition and exercise and all kinds of things should be thought through that says when these indicators happen, these are the interventions that I've already thought out ahead of time. So if you think about it, what we're doing is we're creating a real plan that says we've thought these things out ahead of time. We've made these decisions about what to do so that when this event happens, I'm going to not have these decisions made while I'm flipping out, while I'm not in a position to make sound and rational decisions. If you think about it, the people around us are flipping out even more sometimes. We don't want them to be making these decisions when they're being irrational. So it's way better if we take the responsibility for it and define what it is we want include the members of our team in thinking that through, but the bottom line should be it's our decision. We're the ones that are going to have to go through this. We're the ones that should be saying this is how we want to. Now we had agreements in the building your team section. Those certainly play a role in here, especially this crisis agreement that says my wife isn't going to be calling the sheriff on me unless she first calls my doctor and they both agree that this is a situation that warrants that. So we talked about that in the tool set, but it's especially relevant in crisis. We want to make sure that there are agreements already in place so that there's communication happening between our important team members. If we were to have a solid crisis plan, we would be able to get through our crises much better and probably for less time. When we build our other plans, our likelihood of getting into crisis goes down every time we graduate to a new stage. But there can be someone even in stability stage that can have a crisis. The only time you're guaranteed never to have a crisis again is when you're no longer breathing. When you're dead, it's too late to have a crisis. But up until then, it's always a possibility. So we should at least have that as part of our plan. Obviously, we're going to build that plan when we're in the managed stage, because that's when we're most likely to get into the crisis. But we shouldn't abandon that plan just because we think we're beyond that, because it may happen sometime. Don't forget, crisis planning is not planning for success, crisis planning is planning for failure. It's a backup plan. It's not our wellness plan. It's our backup plan. It's not our success plan. It's our failure plan.